Although she was an enslaved person, Phyllis Wheatley Peters was one of the best known poets in pre 19th century America. Educated and enslaved in the household of prominent Boston commercialist John Wheatley, lionized in New England and England, with presses in both places publishing her poems, and paraded before the New Republic's political leadership and the old empire's aristocracy. Wheatley was the abolitionist's illustrative testimony that blacks could be both artistic and intellectual. Her name was a household word among literate colonists and her achievements a catalyst for the fledgling anti-slavery movement. It should be noted that Christianity was entrenched in Africa centuries before it reached Western Europe. One historian notes, Christianity in Africa is so old that it can rightly be described as an indigenous traditional and African religion. Long before the start of Islam in the 7th century, Christianity was well established all over North Africa, Egypt, parts of the Sudan, and Ethiopia. By the end of the 2nd century, North Africa was so thoroughly Christianized that Tertullian could protest to the emperor, we have left nothing to you but the temples of your gods. Although thousands of Africans were living as Christians prior to the transatlantic slave trade, some Africans were exposed to Christianity once they arrived in the United States. Phyllis Wheatley even describes coming out of what she describes as pagan. However, she and all other Africans wrestled with the disunity between the Christianity of the Bible and the unequal and often unbiblical brand of Christianity prevalent in America for the first several centuries of the country's existence. But in spite of the obstacles to their faith and the challenges to trusting a living God who also seems to be trusted by your oppressors, Phyllis Wheatley and many others learned about, taught about, and wrote about the glory and salvific power of Jesus the Christ. Stay tuned until the end. If this is your first time here, make sure and hit that subscribe button so that you never miss a video or an interview. Our goal is to help you enter into a confirmed, confident, and eternal relationship with the source of all life and purpose. Phyllis Wheatley, born 1753 in present-day Senegal, which is in West Africa, died December 5th, 1784 in Boston, Massachusetts, the first black woman to become a poet of note in the United States. Wheatley was seized from Senegal, Gambia, West Africa when she was about seven years old. She was transported to the Boston docks with a shipment of refugee slaves who, because of age or physical frailty, were unsuited for rigorous labor in the West Indian and Southern colonies, the first ports of call after the Atlantic crossing. In the month of August 1761, in want of a domestic, Susanna Wheatley, wife of prominent Boston tailor John Wheatley, purchased a slender, frail female child for a trifle. Because the captain of the slave ship believed that the waif was terminally ill and he wanted to gain at least a small profit before she died. A Wheatley relative later reported that the family surmised the girl, who was of slender frame and evidently suffering from a change of climate, nearly naked, with no other covering than a quantity of dirty carpet about her, to be about seven years old from the circumstances of shedding her front teeth. After discovering the girl's precociousness, the Wheatleys, including their son Nathaniel and their daughter Mary, did not entirely excuse Wheatley from her domestic duties, but taught her to read and write. Soon, she was immersed in the Bible, astronomy, geography, history, British literature, particularly John Milton and Alexander Pope, and the Greek and Latin classics of Virgil, Ovid, Terence, and Homer. In To the University of Cambridge in New England, probably the first poem she wrote, but not published until 1773, Wheatley indicated that despite this exposure, rich and unusual for an American slave, her spirit yearned for the intellectual challenge of a more academic atmosphere. In addition to classical and neoclassical techniques, Wheatley applied biblical symbolism to evangelize and to comment on slavery. For instance, on being brought from Africa to America, the best known Wheatley poem, chides the Great Awakening audience to remember that Africans must be included in the Christian stream. She writes, Some view our sable race with scornful eye. Their color is a diabolic dye. Remember, Christians, Negroes, black as cane. I may be refined and join the angelic train. 
The remainder of Wheatley's themes can be classified as celebrations of America. She was the first to applaud this nation as glorious Columbia, and that in a letter to no less than the first president of the United States, George Washington, with whom she had corresponded and whom she was later privileged to meet. Her love of Virgin America as well as her religious fervor is further suggested by the names of these colonial leaders who signed the attestation that appeared in some copies of poems on various subjects to authenticate and support her work. Thomas Hutchinson, Governor of Massachusetts, John Hancock, Andrew Oliver, Lieutenant Governor James Bowdoin, and Reverend Mather Biles. Another fervent Wheatley supporter was Dr. Benjamin Rush, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Wheatley's position highlights the dual realities of loving Christ and wanting your country to truly love Christ, which is best exemplified in how one lives for Christ. The slaves did their best to live into the hope that can only come from and through Jesus. In the words of the Apostle Paul, for we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Hope sustained them through the centuries. But it's important to understand that this was not a blind hope. This hope was firmly theological and soundly evidential, based upon what they read and personally experienced from God himself. Brandon Washington writes, arm yourself with justification for your faith. Doing so will allow you to convey knowledge instead of blind hope. Knowledge is epistemologically superior to hopeful speculation, but a vision without substance is just a wish. The desires of our heart and the focus of our lives often never make it past the stage of being a fanciful wish. Often our actions don't coincide with the worldview that we verbalize. In the most difficult of conditions, many of the African slaves found hope in Christ and lived that hope out, often doing so better than those that professed to live by the same faith, but whose actions violated the dictates of Christ. As an exhibition of African intelligence exploitable by members of the Enlightenment movement, by evangelical Christians, and by other abolitionists, she was perhaps recognized even more in England and Europe than in America. Early 20th century critics of black American literature were not very kind to Wheatley Peters because of her supposed lack of concern about slavery. She, however, did have a statement to make about the institution of slavery, and she made it to the most influential segment of 18th century society the institutional church. Two of the greatest influences on Phyllis Wheatley Peters' thought and poetry were the Bible and 18th century evangelical Christianity. But until fairly recently, her critics did not consider her use of biblical allusion nor its symbolic application as a statement against slavery. She often spoke in explicit biblical language designed to move church members to decisive action. For instance, these bold lines in her poetic eulogy to General David Wooster castigate patriots who confess Christianity, yet oppress her people. But how presumptuous shall we hope to find divine acceptance with the almighty mind, while yet, O oh, deed ungenerous, they disgrace, and hold in bondage Afric, blameless race. Let virtue reign and then accord our prayers, be victory ours and generous freedom theirs. Additionally, in a poem read at the University of Cambridge, Wheatley wrote, while intrinsic ardor prompts to write, the muse has promised to assist my pen. Twas not long since I left my native shore, the land of errors and Egyptian gloom. Father of mercy, twas thy gracious hand brought me in safety from those dark abodes. Students to you, tis given to scan the heights above to traverse the ethereal space and mark the systems of revolving worlds. Still more, ye sons of science, ye receive the blissful news by messengers from heaven. How Jesus' blood for your redemption flows. See him with hands outstretched upon the cross. Immense compassion in his bosom glows. He hears revilers nor resents their scorn. What matchless mercy in the Son of God. When the whole human race by sin had fallen, he deigned to die that they might rise again and share with him in the sublimest skies, life without death, and glory without end. Improve your privileges while they stay, ye peoples, and each hour redeem. That bears or good or bad report of you to heaven, let sin that baneful evil to the soul. 
by you be shunned, nor once remit your guard. Suppress the deadly serpent in its egg, ye blooming plants of human race divine. An Ethiop tells you, tis your greatest foe, its transient sweetness turns to endless pain, and in immense perdition sinks the soul. The poem's speaker, who can be read as Phyllis Wheatley herself, addresses students at Harvard University, calling on them to be grateful for the privileges that God has afforded them. The speaker argues that these students and people in general should always remember Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and reject sinfulness. In doing so, the speaker says people can stay close to God and avoid endless pain. Many other slaves describe what Christ had personally done for them and how his impact was true and irrespective of the slave master's words and actions. Intense agony continued for a time. On a Sunday night, I read the first chapter of Job, hoping for comfort, went to bed, had a vision. Two men seemed to be after me with a pistol, resolved to kill me. Somehow I overcame them and compelled them to walk before me until I came to a white house. Here I saw a throne. On the throne was Pilate. Before him stood the Savior bound with a new grass rope. I said, they've crucified my Lord and Master again. The Savior seemed to speak and ask, are you not a Christian? I shook my head saying no. The third time of the question and answer, he said, yes, you are a Christian, follow me. He then burst his bonds and walking away from Pilate's judgment seat said, I've chosen you to preach my word. Fast forwarding a couple of centuries, the legacy of Phyllis Wheatley has endured. Historically, the black church acted as an independent institution within black communities that served a variety of secular functions. Within sacred spaces, settlement work was among one of many secular activities led by African-American churchwomen, one shaped by Christian principles of reaching out and helping those who were poor. Although men constituted the ministerial leadership in the Black Baptist and African Methodist Episcopal churches, women constituted the leadership in settlement work in the majority of members of the Black Baptist and AME churches. Consequently, Black denominational churches and settlement work were women's fears, giving Black club women power to wield influence in both the religious and secular community in fighting against the oppressive forces of poverty and homelessness. As caretakers, nurturers, and religious instructors, Black club women garnered much economic support from the black church. In January 1911, the Phyllis Wheatley Club organized a mass meeting of all the black middle class women in the city to be held at Bethel AME Church on Sunday, January 29, 1911 at 3 p.m. God worked in and through many slaves and former slaves, and we can all continue in their lineage today, just as we do with the lineage of the disciples and the early church fathers. One former slave wrote, I am a great Christian. When I was converted, I passed through many ordeals. I was a person who did not want to give up all of the worldly things, although I wanted to be a good Christian. I love to drink and I love to play the fiddle, and I don't believe anyone can be a good, devout Christian and do these things. A long time after the first spell, I got sick again. And this time I was so sick that I would not move my hands or feet. In whatever way they placed me, there I stayed until somebody turned me over. Again, I prayed and told God how I had not done what I had promised. One day, while I was very sick and weaker than usual, I saw the heavens open, and the same voice said to me, If you are sick, behold, I am a doctor. At the same time, the hand came forth and seemed to slap me in my face, until that minute I had not been able to raise my hand, but immediately I gained strength. And in less than five minutes, I felt strong enough to get up, dress, and go out. From this time on, I promise to serve the Lord and try to become a Christian. But I would love to know your thoughts in the comments. How does the legacy of those that came before us impact you? And what do you gain from the life and work of Phyllis Wheatley? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. And until next time, peace.